Right, so, main aim for today's little video is to uh, answer some of the questions that you guys asked over Instagram. Um, for Tom, here. At the lattice. Yeah, because I think you guys ask me and Joe training questions all the time. Yeah. And we're quite reluctant to answer them because we don't really know what we're doing in the slightest. Yeah. So it's good that we have Tom here so now we can actually learn and also hopefully answer some of the questions that we get asked all the time. Yeah. Cool. Right. So a lot of people ask are all about uh, hangboarding and when to start hangboarding. So uh, essentially the question we're going to answer is when is it safe to start fingerboarding and what would you recommend for a first hangboard routine? Okay, yeah, like I just said, really popular question and I think the first thing to, uh, I guess, get you know, clear straight away is that no form of climbing or training is ever safe or entirely safe. There's always some level of risk and this is the nature of training and creating progression because you're trying to overload the body. So there's always gonna be a level of risk. Yeah. But what we can try and do is do things in a safe and possible manner or reduce the risks. So with regards to fingerboard training, I would say the key markers to lowering that level of risk and making it an appropriate training tool is that one that the person has a familiarity with it. So that if you're gonna start some sort of training regime on a fingerboard, you've done some sessions where you've actually just played around with it. You've become familiar with the tool, so you know what a hang feels like, you know how you want to hold your shoulders, you know what the different grip positions feel like, and you've kind of got some help with some other people showing you a few tips. So it can be really informal, but some familiarity. Yeah. And then the second is that uh, the climber isn't doing this the first ever time that they're going climbing, so they have no level of adaptation to a fingerboard and hanging weightless or hanging footless on a training item so they want to have a level of climbing experience behind them and it's really difficult to say where that number lies i suppose the the shortest possible answer i can give on it is that you have a level of familiarity if you get on a fingerboard informally in a climbing session it feels quite familiar it doesn't feel total maximum intensity if you're hanging at body weight and you've experimented with lots of climbing holds and grip positions over time, that's when you might want to start to look at it. Okay. So I think the number one thing to get right, first of all, is actually setting up the body and the hanging position so that your shoulders and body lie in a position which is appropriate for a hangboard session. Yeah. Uh, so one, it has to be relatively sport specific. So let's not put our bodies in a position we'd never do yeah. on a climbing wall, that'd be weird. Yeah. Um, and then secondly is that we want to have a level of control so that we um, aren't sagging out of positions, we're not moving around when we're doing the hangs okay. and we have familiarity around it. Yeah. So if we, let's just take the top edge on yeah. this fingerboard here, which is a nice big round comes wedge. Yeah. You could do exactly the same thing on a pull up bar just to get familiarity with the position. Yeah. And what I want you to do is to hang in a position where you are totally relaxed and you're hanging off your entire skeleton. Yeah. But on the other hand, you're not so pull far pulled up that you haven't got your chest rotating up towards the fingerboard and your shoulders are wide open. It's just like a mid position of comfort okay. where your shoulders are engaged. Right. Let's hope that I can get this right, you know. So if you... If I'm like this? Yeah, so just relax a little bit more. Yeah, that's a little bit more like it. Are those, short, those arms straight? Not straight, they're slightly, do you want them completely straight? Okay, so this is another good question actually, uh, or a good <coughs> issue, is that um, I haven't seen anything in terms of when we've been training with climbers over the years, any real difference between training with straight arms on a fingerboard yeah. versus a bent arm. Okay. And I think my logic as a coach is that when we climb, we hold holds in both straight arm and slightly contracted positions. So logically, yeah. if we're doing a very progressive static exercise, then yeah. we should become familiar in both positions. Okay. What doesn't seem a good idea is to have that position where we're really relaxed and the, the shoulder is right up by the ear because we're just providing so much kind of, um, I guess, uh, a sort of closing up of a position. We might antagonize the shoulder. Uh, we can get uh, nerve impingement in the shoulders and it also doesn't promote the ability to be able to hold the shoulder back and develop strength in that range. So that's why we try and get people to be engaged. Engage with it. Um, the other thing I think is grip positions. Yeah, grip positions. On the board. Um, so if we take our fingerboard here, yep. we have uh, a few different grip positions we can use on the board. Right at the top is we have our full 
crimp grip position yeah. where the thumb wrapped over and you can see a close to 90 degree angle in the index finger in there. Then we come down to a half crimp grip position where most of the fingers are at 90 degrees yeah. and the thumb is wrapped up over the hand. And then finally, an open crimp, crimp grip position or open four position yeah. where the index finger and the little finger are more open. Yeah. And then finally, we have a full drag position where all of the fingers are really open. Yeah. And all four of these positions in any climber should be used in their, uh, their training regime. So you want a variety of grip positions, but some of them carry a greater risk than others. In my experience, the greatest risk is the full crimp grip position. Yeah. So I think you have to be extremely careful how much that's used in climbing. I tend to use that only with elite level climbers who are very, very familiar and strong in this position. And then also the three finger grip position is that you'll notice that on some climbers, it, depending on the relative length of their fingers, is it can really excessively load the, lip, the ring finger. Oh, okay. So you just have to be a little bit careful on that grip position as well, that you just okay. don't excessively load that finger. Yeah. That anyone out there who's you know, starting some sort of fingerboard regime should think about what cr uh, grip position is most useful to the style of climbing they're doing, and also how uh, much difference is there between their strongest grip positions and their weakest grip positions, and just try and even out that balance with time because what can happen is you excessively work the strong grip position because yeah. you feel so familiar with it and you completely ignore the weak one because yeah. you feel weak yeah um, but if you're going to work on that non-preferred weaker grip position just be really cautious with it take your time steady sessions don't push it too much and lots and lots of recovery and rest so, so the other part of the question was how should someone approach their kind of first handboard workout like how to get started on the handboard okay so if you're um, doing some of your first hangboard workouts the first thing that you really want to do is choose a grip type that you're going to train so we talked about preferred and non-preferred grips and that's just going to be the starting point it's up to you what you want to choose um, and then secondly is you want to choose the right hold size and intensity that you're going to be working at because if we work at something that's too easy and uh, the, the hold is too small, then we're not gonna be completing the exercise and we'll be failing too early, potentially raising the risk of that doing that training. And likewise, if the hold is too big and the intensity is too low, then we're not gonna be achieving any sort of strength training uh, aims. So the very, very kind of roughest way to do this, other than doing getting a load of weights out and pulleys and trying to work out our maximum hang score is to choose a hold type on a fingerboard and this one up here has got two different hold sizes so a 20 mil and a 40 mil rounded edge other fingerboards will have four five six seven different options of hold sizes and what you're looking for is a hold size with your grip position that you can hang for just 20 to 30 seconds so that's not totally desperate i'm falling after three yeah. seconds but that's not I could hang on here for 45 seconds, a minute or longer. And then next is you're gonna got two main options that people generally use for their fingerboarding. One is called repeaters, and the other might be termed as something like maximal hangs or max hangs. First one, let's do repeaters. Yep. Now repeaters are a fingerboard method where we're going to uh, hang for a duration and then rest for a duration, hang for a duration, but in quite short uh, intermittent blocks. So we're not taking big long rest periods, it's on, off, on, off. A classic uh, repeater set that a lot of people use, and again, you can vary these yeah. as always, is a seven second on, three second off yeah. repeater cycle. If you think about the numbers, seven plus three equals 10, so we do six of those, it equals a minute. That's a really good place to start. So let's try a one minute repeater block yeah so okay. that's going to be seven on three off so, okay you ready yeah and go seven six five four three two one off three two one on seven six five four three two one off three two
Nice. Perfect. Cool. So what was really good there was you maintained that stable shoulder position. You're always slightly engaged in the shoulders because uh, the distance between the shoulders and the ear on the side, you maintain exactly the same grip position all the way out. You kept the work ratio or the work time consistent, you kept the rest time consistent and you completed the set. Yeah. If you were to train that and try to make improvements, what you can do over time is try to increase the total amount of work that you might do. So for example, if one set felt pretty hard for you, yeah. doing just that one minute of block, you could then increase to two sets, to three sets, to four sets, to five sets. Yeah. And that's the way in which we can build progression in that repeater set. You can, of course, add weight, but initially when you're first starting to go into your fingerboard, it's nice to start to build work capacity, so the amount that you can do in a session yeah. on that body weight hold. Uh, so the main difference with max hangs is that you're going to be taking a, the, or rather the similarities first of all, is you're going to be using the same grip positions, uh, same shoulder position, that's exactly right. But on this one, you're going to be uh, slightly increasing the time that you do that hang, but you're going to be massively increasing the rest time on this. And then we're going to talk about the progressions from that. So if we were to take this uh, board here, is you're going to be doing a 10 second hang, yeah. 10 seconds of work contraction, and then you're going to be resting two, two and a half, three minutes from that hang. And then you're going to do that hang again and you're gonna complete just, say, six hangs in a whole session. Yeah. And what's key with that one to create the progression is that we're gonna slowly add to the intensity of that hang. And you can do that by adding weight. So you could wear a harness and add weight to that harness, yeah. slowly progressively over time, maybe building up around two kilos each time. Or we can slowly reduce the size of the hold to increase the intensity of the session. But what's key on that max hang session is that we're really working the intensity element rather than the sort of work capacity and increasing the time and the duration. Yeah. Um, and again, just really slow, really progressive, plenty of rest, you know, multiple days between sessions and don't just hammer it from the yeah. gates, build up yeah. really slowly. Proceed with caution. Yeah, exactly. Because it produces the best results. Yeah. I'm not saying, you know, proceed with caution because it's all about just trying to reduce the risk element. Yeah. Of course, that does control that and help it, but it's also about generating the best results because we need to train, yeah. but we must rest because the rest is when you're getting stronger, actually. Yeah. You're not getting stronger during the work bit. You're yeah. actually getting weaker in a yeah. way. Um, so it's absolutely key. Cool. Next question. So the next question was, uh, if you got any tips for developing explosive power, and this is actually really good for me because if you watch the latest video, one of the things I need to work on is explosive power. So, yes. what are your tips? Definitely. Uh, so the thing to uh, grasp with explosive power is that we can do it both on the wall, but we can also do it on some basic pull exercises like on a pull-up bar. So there's two different approaches that we can take with it. And then secondly is that for explosive power, the idea that we need to grasp in our training is that it's all about the speed and the execution of that high speed in the climbing movement and the muscles that are involved with it. Lots of people get into this idea that they become more powerful by doing really tiny, small, snatchy movements on really small holds. But in fact, the most effective way to develop power is to do big moves, relatively good holds, but a lot of distance and ground covered. That's the way we're gonna you know, improve our explosive power. And to do that, we have to work at not maximum intensity. Otherwise, we cannot generate the most speed. Yeah. Um, so let's try an exercise yeah. on the wall, yeah. and then we'll do one on the bar as well. And I can give you two different examples of what you can do. So I think probably the best way to explain, demonstrate, and show the difference between strength and power is to maybe get you climbing the same problem in a way in which I think you would work on strength okay. and then the other one which would specifically work more on power. So you can see the difference in styles because yep. people often get the two confused and they think just because I'm strong I'm powerful or yep. just because I'm powerful I'm strong. That's not the case. A uh, classic example of that is Louis Parkinson okay. who's an extremely powerful climber yep. and he uses not every single ounce of strength he has but he uses that strength he has very, very well okay. in a very powerful manner. He's a perfect example of someone who's fully developed a level of power from that. Right. Uh, other climbers who are really static, slow, controlled, uh, excessively strong, not very powerful. Good. That's 
two, that was two, you know, doesn't it? Yeah, and then to the top. Am I allowed that to my feet? Yeah. Oh god. It's still quite dynamic. So what you've noticed is, is you had because you didn't have the strength yeah. to be able to pull that in and lock it off, yeah. you had to use the level of power. Yeah. So that's good. I mean, that's what a good climber should do. Okay. Um, but what I want to do now is try and do that same problem, but now just using power and speed okay. moving through those. So really, you want to be using the hips and creating much more momentum through those moves. And nothing slow controlled. You're really exploding through those moves and trying to cover ground really quickly for those same holes. Speed, yeah. a bit more power on that. I think it's still a little bit too easy for you. Okay. And so what I'm gonna do, make a bit of a edit and change on the problem. Okay. And then we'll be able to work the power element even further. So okay. we're gonna do a little bit of tweaking, tweaking. around the problem. Okay, so we'll get it. Taking that hold out and taking that hold out. Yeah. And what we're doing is to make sure that Joe is genuinely working on the power elements, so that speed element, is that these moves I think are close to impossible by using a static method of climbing. So it's forcing him to really push that power element. Good. Yeah. No pink. Pink foot, yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's, that's much better. Yeah. And should we quickly demonstrate that you can't do that in a slow lock <laughs> position? So I'm not allowed the pink one to start, right? No. Yeah. It's just so, beyond yeah. where locking yeah. off is possible. Right? But imagine if you were so strong that you could lock all yeah. the way down here, yeah. you could do it in that way. Cool. So for someone for someone who's looking to to develop this in their climbing in a session, mm -hmm. what would how could they do an exercise similar to this? What would you maybe recommend? So what you're looking for is a problem which is um, most definitely not a maximum capacity. So let's say you're a uh, a V6 climber, yeah. you want to choose something which you're doing your power work on that's more like perhaps V3 or V4 but has a good distance on the moves so you can't just statically lock it in. Yeah. You want to choose really nice big comfortable holds so you'll be able to work the distance comfortably, you're not loading the fingers uh, in a, a risky manner um, and that the session is enjoyable all the way through the end. Yeah. And you want to really focus with like, it's all about intention so really focus on a high level of speed, lots of ground covered on each move. And you really want to work the session only to the point where you start to see a uh, degradation or, or a, uh, a reduction in speed and distance with which you can do the moves. Yeah. So as soon as you start to see that quality go in the session, just stop the session. Yeah. That's it, you're done. Yeah. You've done your power work. You can move on to something else and do something else in the session. And then you can revisit that and come back to that two or three days later, and work on that power again. Let's show us something on the bar, shall we? Yep. Yeah. yeah, what are we doing? Okay, so pull up bar. Yeah. Really simple piece of equipment. Um, and you can do a very similar thing to this to some of the fingerboards that you have in the market where they have the jugs on the top of the, the fingerboard. Um, so I think either option is works well. You want a bit of space behind it so that if your legs are swinging through, you don't you know, clonk them straight into a wall. But effectively, both pieces of equipment are really effective for building uh, power. and. What you see with a lot of people when they're doing their pull-up work is they're doing quite a slow and controlled movement. And that's great for developing strength. Yeah. Because we're working at a higher intensity, we're working uh, consistently all the way through the range of movement, we're not using any um, momentum or carry through those movements, so we're working all the way through that range of movement strength elements. But what we want to do with power is that we want to cover the full distance of the pull-up as fast as possible. For elite level climbers like yourself, then you're gonna be able to do that at body weight. Yes. So if I get you to do a pull up in a second where you're um, trying to go from the bottom of the pull up to as high as you can the pull up as fast as possible, I think you'll be able to achieve that in a really quick time. So we have a go at that and then we'll talk about variances that we can do on it. Okay. So as high as I can go. Absolutely, but, as high not, as you can. but not, not muscle up. Not, uh, well, go, go as high as you can. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that was good. Yeah. 
But the one bit yeah. that I didn't want to see yeah. was, you know, right at the end, you then start to just squeeze something yeah. out with a little bit of time. Yeah. That's going to be stopping to That's work. That's a power element. So you only want to go speed. as far okay. as you can just go, boom, okay. and really pull all the way through the movement, just as fast as possible. It's all about intention, oh, speed. Okay. speed. Everything is about speed. Good. Better? Yeah, better. There's no push at the end. Yeah, but I want to see even faster. Faster. Faster is all about speed. <laughs> Definitely okay. dips. Okay, so you see a little bit of a yeah. drop there. Yeah, now. yeah, for sure. And that speed is already dropping off. Yeah. So a trick that we can use for this is we can actually give you some assistance so that we can cover the ground faster. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get you to put a harness on. Yeah. And I'm going to give you a little trick. So what we're going to do is if we've got a climber who is struggling to do a pull up really, really fast and exert that explosive force. So let's say the maximum pull up they can do is only with 10 kilograms add to their body weight is that if they do it at body weight, that's still quite a hard pull up for them. Whereas for you, you can do a pull up with lots and lots of added weight added. So it's a relatively easy, low intensity exercise for you is that we can provide assistance to the pull up through a pulley or you know just basically putting a rope and assistance over the pull-up bar and we can drop the intensity for Joe down to an even lower intensity so that he's able to exert extra amounts of speed so by adding assistance we can encourage him to work much faster and travel through that full range of motion on the pull-up at a higher speed okay so we're gonna go in three two one go yeah, really good Okay, shake the arms out. Okay, three, two, one, go. Okay, so if I stop giving you that assistance, do the same thing. Let's see how powerful pull up. Okay, three, two, one, go. <laughs> so you see how that speed's really dropped down now? So for, for Joe, if he was to be doing a power session, we're only six or seven reps in, <laughs> yeah. is already that quality has gone down in session. So technically speaking, he's not really pushing the real kind of limit of the power within his training. So you'd be appropriate to using this assistance in yeah. your pull-up so that we can drop the intensity lower, the speed goes up, it's yeah. really high, intentional, and then we're working on that power element, which I know is important for you. Yeah, definitely important. Cool, brilliant.